started. And thank you all for, for tuning in. And this evening we have Chris Mullins. Chris is a, an extension specialist for greenhouses and specialty crops with Virginia State University. And he's gonna be speaking with us about high tunnel basics. We, we have some folks, I think in the crowd tonight who have expressed an interest in pursuing a high tunnel uh, for their farms. So he's gonna talk about just the basics of that. And uh, Chris, appreciate you speaking with us and I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, Phil, well, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, glad to be here. I appreciate the invitation uh, to talk with you tonight. Um, like Phil said, I work down at Virginia State University, and we, we've been doing uh, some work with high tunnels for several years now, and uh, we see a lot of potential for growers, and uh, maybe that's why y'all are here, to, to look at the potential for a high tunnel in your situation. So let me go ahead and let me share my screen here, and we'll go ahead and get started. I've got a PowerPoint presentation, and if we've got time, we might, let's see here, there we go. All right, I'm assuming everybody can, can see that. Um, <clears throat> so what I wanted to do this, this, uh, this evening was talk a little bit about, um, give you an overview of high tunnels, kind of talk about the basics like Phil said, and uh, to give you uh, an idea about construction and maybe some management. And I've got a couple of videos. If we've got time, I might show a couple of those. And uh, I've got a few, some resources at the, uh, at the end. And then I wanted to leave time definitely at the end um, to, to discuss things and ask questions. And we can just kind of talk about, about this idea of, of high tunnel structures. So let me get started. And some of you um, might have heard of the USDA program through in RCS, it's uh, uh, an EQIP cost share program for high tunnels. And if you haven't, uh, you know, what you should do is, and some of this information right here might not be completely up to date because the, the NRCS people could really, can really inform you about what's going on with this program in both Virginia and in Kentucky. Um, but basically, uh, it's a cost share program, and they'll provide some some money, and it could be as much as sixty or or more percent of the cost of a structure, up to a certain amount. Uh, and they're looking for certain things, though they want things to be grown in the ground and and such uh, some that some things like that. But it's a really good program if you are interested in in uh, having a high tunnel this is a good way to get into it. Anytime you can get some of that cost paid for, it's a great thing for you, whether it's a, an enterprise or a, a home hobby system or something like that. So um, contact your local NRCS office, usually at a USDA service center, and, and every, uh, all the agents here can, can help you with that if, uh, if you don't know where that is in your area. So check that out. I think it's worth looking into. So when we think about high tunnels, really what we're talking about is season extension. And, and you know, that just means we're using some type of tool uh, that allows a crop to be cultivated outside of its normal production season. Um, so here you see pictures of just typical high tunnels that we're thinking of on the right, and then more of the multi-bay high tunnels that you might see in, uh, in, on the West Coast for berries and some fruit crops and things like that. But anyway, I, there's probably an opportunity for, for some of you when you're thinking about this enterprise or maybe you're already growing and selling horticultural crops, maybe vegetables. Um, a high tunnel is going to be a tool that's going to give you some opportunities um, for that season extension. You're having the earliness in the, in the springtime and even extending the growing season into the fall and maybe even having some protection to be able to go through with some really cool season crops through the winter time. It also might give you the ability to have uh, really high yields and, and potentially good quality. Um, and the other thing is that sometimes in these tunnels you see a lot less insect and disease pressure or problems. Um, so that's, it's good that way. You can kind of to some degree exclude insects and, and because you're covered maybe you're going to have a little bit less disease problems. So it can fit well into an organic uh, cropping situation. And then as, as we think about things like locally grown, you know, this, uh, that's becoming very important to people, the idea of having something that's locally grown. 
if you're going to sell crops, um, you know, this might be able a good way to be out of season and be local to to an area where you've got a good sized customer base. So what we're going to talk about today, because there's different ways to think about, you know, season extension from from a, uh, just row covers and things all the way up to a full blown greenhouse. But I think today uh, we're going to talk mostly about high tunnels or hoop houses. Sometimes we might call them cold frames or it might call it a, an unheated greenhouse. There's lots of different names for it, but we're talking about a, a structure that uh, looks a lot like what we're talking about in these in these pictures here. And, and here's some definitions when we think about a, a high tunnel. It, and, and you can look at these pictures and kind of see they they're a structure that resembles a conventional greenhouse, uh, usually made out of metal, metal frame, but it can be wood, it could be PVC, uh, it could be something else. Uh, crops are generally grown in the ground um, in conventional type production, you know, maybe even uh, on plastic mulch uh, or maybe just bare ground, um, various ways, maybe even in raised beds. And again, like I mentioned before, we're looking for season extension, that, that earliness or that, uh, that pushing, pushing the growing season into the, into the uh, late fall because this structure you know, protects those crops from, from adverse weather conditions, from, from light frost, from rain and hail events. And so it's, uh, it can be a really good situation. Now, again, the picture on the bottom there, the bottom right is more of a, a multi-bay uh, field scale structure. So it's a, you know, we don't see that as much in Virginia and Kentucky. We see that in, in different places. And th but that's really for main season production whereas the pictures of the others that you see are more for season extension. And here's some more examples of them here. You can see uh, these pictures on the top are metal frame structures. They look a lot like a conventional greenhouse. Uh, they've got some components to them that we'll talk about when, when we go over in just a minute about the construction phase, but, uh, <clears throat> but pretty much looks like a greenhouse. On the bottom there, there's a picture of a, uh, a PVC structure. Now, some people will try to use that and they work fairly well. They're not as long lived as the metal structures. In fact, on that picture there, you can kind of see if you kind of look at it, it looks like it's a little bent to one side. That, that particular grower had gotten a lot of wind and that, that PVC had kind of shifted and kind of bent, uh, but it worked for him. This particular grower um, already had a roadside stand where he sold his vegetables at and in, in southeastern Virginia. And uh, he didn't want to go to all the expense uh, until he saw maybe some benefits to this, you know, putting something up like this. And so um, he had a couple beds with an early season variety of tomatoes in there uh, and plastic mulch and drip irrigation. And he put this little PVC structure over it. And he saw that he got uh, some earliness out of that more than he thought. And he got good production out of there. So. For him, that worked, and it was kind of proof of concept. And he was able to uh, the next season. He uh, he spent a little bit more money and put up a, a structure much like you see in the top pictures. And uh, so it's worked for him. It's worked for him pretty good. And here you see some different other other type pictures, different ones with uh, you know even a chicken house, a poultry house there at the top uh, right that's kind of been converted into a structure that's unheated. You could, could almost call that a, a high tunnel. So when we're thinking about these high tunnels and you're thinking about maybe putting one up, uh, in the planning stages, you wanna think about where you're gonna locate it. And generally for these structures, because they're ventilated or cooled by these drop down curtains, these side curtains that are opened to allow ventilation. And so generally what we look at is a way to, uh, to orient those based on that, uh, that ventilation factor. So, um, so if on your farm, if your uh, wind is generally coming from the west or something like that, or maybe even coming from the south a little bit, uh, you'd want to orient it so that that prevailing wind for most of the year is going to be passing through, through those curtains. Um, so kind of perpendicular to the length of the structure. Um, because cooling is important, especially if you've got tall crops in there. So we don't look at light and shading uh, from the 
metal components like we do with a greenhouse for orientation. We look more at, at cooling. Um, so if that makes sense, the, where the prevailing winds are, you'd probably want to orient it the ridge uh, perpendicular to where your normal prevailing winds are. Um, but you want to also watch out for, for a lot of shade, and we'll talk about that in a little bit around, around the structure when you're siding it. And, and just like any good vegetable plot, you want to make sure that it's, it's well drained where you're, where you're putting this. Um, now you can help that. Um, if you have to put it in a certain location, you can, um, you can make swells around the structure to carry water off. You could probably even put um, drain tile or drain pipe in, the, in there to move it away if you've got a, an area you have to put it at that's, you know, doesn't, you know, you need to move, move water around the structure instead of going through it. Um, but generally you wanna, you wanna find an area that's, that's well drained. Um, there's a link on the bottom here, and I've got some resources at the, on the last slide here that, that uh, you'll have available to you. But uh, basically, there's a good, there's a good uh, PowerPoint presentation. If you were to Google uh, heat, high tunnel heating alternatives, and this guy's named Bob Schulteis, you'll see that at the, at the bottom of the screen, you'll find a good presentation that goes through and talks a lot about uh, different ways to heat and cool um, a, high, a high tunnel structure through passive heating and, and cooling, a lot like some of the cooling I've talked about to just now, but, but check that out. That's a pretty good resource and it's a lot more detailed than we really have time to go into tonight. <clears throat> so let's look a little bit at construction um, because for most people that are going to put a structure up, they're going to find that it's something that they can put up themselves. Um, there's various components that you see here, the, the, the bows and the purlins and all those kind of things. And I'll go over those a little bit more in a second. Um, but it's, it's a metal frame. Um, and like I said, a lot of you can, can do this yourself. Uh, it does, you do need a little bit of construction knowledge. You're on ladder some, you know, if that's an issue for you, you might, might not want to do it, but, and you're going to need a few tools like uh, drills and uh, uh, some saws and things like that. Um, so it can be built by yourself, uh, but there are also people that are contractors that are out there doing this kind of work and they can and they can put this up for you for a cost. There are some companies that do that. And even sometimes if you can't find a company that does this, there's probably gonna be somebody in your area that has a greenhouse or has a um, you know high tunnel that maybe has put it up themselves and they might even help you with that or, or you might be able to pay them to put, put it up for you. Um, so there are some options, I think, there for you. But when we think about construction, there's a few basic parts and pieces, and you can kind of see them pointed to right here, where the, uh, the, the purlins are the lengthy pipes, that, the tubing that goes down the, the whole length of the structure, and they keep, really keep the structure from racking back and forth. There are ground stakes that grow in the ground, there's bows, and I'll show you these a little bit more in, in detail in just a second. Um, braces and such. And you see some wood components uh, here, baseboards and hip boards that uh, really make the structure uh, solid once you, once you put it together. So if you were to buy one of these structures, and, and now you can, um, you can buy these frames from greenhouse companies, and uh, I've listed a few at the end, but it's easy to Google high tunnel manufacturers or greenhouse manufacturers, and you'll find, you'll find lots of them out there that uh, sell frames and, and heaters and fans and all that stuff too, but we're mostly talking about a high tunnel frame here, which is a galvanized, hot dip, hot dip galvanized metal um, pipe um, that's usually already bent for you and it's ready to go together. You've got all the, uh, <clears throat> it all comes together generally, all the pieces and parts, all the hardware, which I'm all the screws and the, the wire lock and everything that you would need usually comes in a package. So like, like that picture you see on the right kind of bottom or middle, um, it all generally will come something like that or maybe even longer pieces like you see on that trailer there in the bottom picture. Um, and it's, but you know, when you get it in, just like anything else you buy and get in, make sure that you have all the things there um, before the delivery driver or whoever gets too far so that um, you, know, you can make, a, make sure that you've got everything that you need to, to put that up. So anyway, we talked about the site. You want to have a good site that's fairly, that's fairly level um, as much as it can be. So that top picture there, um, 
was several years ago now, it looks like from that date I see. Um, that was in Washington County, so down near Abingdon. And, uh, you know, like many of you all, there, it's, it's kind of a hilly site, uh, not a whole lot of real flat ground, but um, they ended up, uh, there was a swell they took on one side over there to kind of keep the water from, from, from getting uh, running through down the hill. Um, <clears throat> so, but anyway, what you want to do is you want to square up that area. If you've done any kind of construction in the past, you know that uh, it's important to, to square up all the corners to make sure that, um, that if you start that way, if you start square, um, you're going to, everything's going to make, everything will be easier when you, when you start to put things together. When you put pipes together, if there's already pre-drilled holes, they'll all fit and it'll work for you much better. So just, uh, just using some simple uh, math that we learned in high school, I think you can do that with a measuring tape and, and square that area up. So once you do that, um, and you can, there, you're going to have some ground stakes, and you see that bottom picture, even the top picture, there's some stakes, they look like they're about two, they're usually two or three, they're about three feet long, and they usually go in the ground about two feet, and uh, this is probably the hardest work of putting one of these structures up, is actually pounding these ground stakes into the ground, especially if you're in a rocky area, but um, they need to be pushed into the ground pretty deep, and they're, they're what anchors and holds it all to the you know, into the ground. And after they've been there for a few years, they kind of rust into the ground a little bit, kind of become very connected with the ground. And it's much more solid after a few years. Of, uh, in fact, they're sometimes hard to give, get, get up out of the ground if they've been there for a while. Um, <clears throat> and you can see uh, there's usually you put up a string line to get your level and even uh, to get your height and, and, and things like that. And what I'd like to mention too about the leveling aspect is it's good to have uh, this structure level from side to side. It's not as important along the length of it. It'd be nice for it to all be perfectly level, but especially side to side, you want it to be level that way. So anyway, using line levels and using strings, strings um, and, and then post levels like you see on the bottom, uh, picture there to get those posts plumb, uh, you, can, you can get this thing started right. All right. The next part is to put up the bows, which are the, the framework or the backbone kind of of the, of the structure. You can see what they look like down that bottom picture. It's, it makes it look like a structure is finally going up. And those just usually insert in or on the outside or with a sleeve or something, depending on the manufacturer, into those ground stakes. And they, they connect there. And that's what uh, makes the structure. And then those purlins are the long pieces that hold, hold all those bows together. And so when, once you get all that kind of put together, um, you'll have a pretty solid, pretty solid structure. And usually these structures are, sometimes they're, sometimes they're put together, they're pre-drilled and you put bolts through them and, and nuts and you, and you put them together like that. But more of, often than not, the, you use self-tapping screws, or called tech screws sometimes, and uh, they just go right in and usually connect clamps to, uh, to hold purlins in. You use that to, those screws to go through maybe wood to hold it down to the baseboard into the, into the metal, different things like that. Um, and again, I'm, I'm speaking in a lot of generalities because every manufacturer, whether it's a company like Atlas or Puckett or FarmTech, um, or Jader Loon, they kind of all use a little bit different, um, a little bit, there's a little bit of difference in their, in their uh, structures that they, that they kind of have their own, their own kind of signature on it. You also can have trusses. And if you look at that bottom picture um, on the left, you'll see that there it looks more like a truss arrangement there. It's not just a bare purlin. So that's going to be a more expensive arrangement, first of all, but it's probably going to end up being a much stronger uh, arrangement there. And while we're on the subject of strength, um, you know, you can get these so that they're, uh, you have uh, architect engineered stamped plans that show that the structure when it's, when it's put up properly has so much snow load or wind resistance and things like that. So, so there's, there's, uh, there's definitely some of these are very strong and they're, they're all strong, but if, if you need those stamped plans, you can get those from a manufacturer usually also. Um, <coughs> excuse me, the next step after you've got the metal frame is to put the, 
the baseboards on. So the baseboard is what you see in the top right picture. It's what really holds, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's wood usually. Uh, the picture on the top right is actually a metal baseboard, but most of the time it's wood. It's some type of dimensional lumber, two by 10 or a two by 12, or maybe a two by eight even, that runs along the bottom on the ground and connects to those ground stakes that you put in. You can see there that top right picture, there's a um, ground stake and it's connected to the bow. And then that piece of wood is right up against it. So that, that creates a, that, that wood creates a, po a point where you're gonna attach plastic to uh, and also seals against the ground there to kind of seal up any leaks from coming underneath that, um, that uh, board. The other thing is the hip board and you see on that bottom picture, that's the uh, board that's a little bit higher up. And so on these high tunnel structures, like we talked about, there's um, ventilation through the side curtains, which I'll show you in a second. And those are gonna be your points of attachment for those side curtains to kind of give you a, it's kind of the way to frame out for those, for those curtains. All right, let's see here. <clears throat> and once you get those side boards and the hip boards on, you've got your metal frame all together, um, and maybe even in your end walls frame, we'll talk about that in a second, you're ready for the plastic to go on. And so on these structures, we're gonna put uh, greenhouse grade plastic. So it's not gonna be plastic that's you know, from the hardware store that's gonna be only maybe one year of UV protection on it. You probably should put um, a greenhouse grade plastic that's gonna be UV protected for about four years. It's gonna be about six mil in thickness. And you're usually gonna put one or maybe two layers. Most conventional greenhouses that are covered with polyethylene have two layers of plastic and they use a fan like you see on the top picture there. And that blows air in between those two layers kind of like and puffs it up kind of like a balloon. And that creates a dead air space on the, on the roof of their structure. And so it creates insulating value but also it creates an area where wind kind of glances off of it and doesn't, doesn't move the plastic around so much. So, so it's gonna be one or two layers depending on your situation, whether you've got a, uh, a blower or not. Uh, but really this plastic, I, I know a lot of growers, they wanna, they wanna run this plastic as long as they can because it's expensive. Um, but probably every four or five years, it really should be replaced. Um, because it gets dirty, UV protection is, is, is going away, it gets brittle. And so uh, while it is an expense, it's one that's probably worth it every four to five years. And there are lots of different plastics out there. We, we probably won't go into that now, but there's um, lots of different ones you can look at that have some different types of coatings on them that, are, that are, can be good in a lot of situations, in some situations. So I'll just show you the next few pictures of, of how I think is a, is a good way to put plastic on. Some of you might have put plastic on a greenhouse before, some of you haven't. But it, it is a little bit of, a, of something that can be difficult and it can be a real problem. And when you've spent four or $500 on a sheet of plastic, you, know, you wanna make sure that it doesn't rip, doesn't get torn up when you're trying to install it. So you can see here that this structure is all uh, framed up, it's, it's ready to go. And so uh, this is a morning, uh, it's best to have no wind or as little wind as possible when you're covering it. So this is probably a morning. Uh, you could also do it later in the, in the evening as wind is, is, is kind of dying down from the daytime. And you roll the plastic out, it is <clears throat> in a roll and it's usually folded in, a, in so, some way, you know, there's different ways that they're folded, but you roll it out, you unfold it a little bit and you can see here that, that ropes have been thrown across this structure from one from the outside to the, to the side where the plastic is. And that's tied to the plastic. And then it's just, you get you know, people on the other side and they just pull it over. So I make it sound simple, but if you get wind gusts, it can be a real problem. So you can see how it's tied and it's being pulled over that structure there. And you can ease it over there with a push broom or something so it doesn't snag on some of that metal. Uh, but you and you do want to make sure that it's not going to get snagged on that metal and rip even though it's six mil thickness it, it, it rips for fairly easy but you just pull you see you've got three or four people on a structure you pull and it comes over and then on that hip board um, in this picture here you can see that there is a um, some this is a type of 
material that you can lock the plastic down with. This is called a wire lock or poly lock or um, wiggle wires, what this one is called. And it's a base <clears throat> that you sandwich between that metal, that aluminum base, and uh, uh, you put the plastic there and then you have that wire. You can see this picture, he's just kind of weaving that wire in there and that really holds the plastic against that uh, in there, sandwiches it between two pieces of metal. And it really does a nice job of keeping it from moving. So that's how that plastic end up, ends up getting attached uh, to the structure. So as we look at the end walls, you know, that's the, the two end walls that you've got to do something with. You've covered it, you've built the structure, you've covered it, and you've probably framed your end walls in some way. And you can see different ones here. And they're going to be based on how you might use the structure. So if you look at, say, the bottom uh, left picture, you know, he, this, uh, that was a farmer in Amelia County who, who was going to go in there and grow some tomatoes. And he wanted to be able to till the ground up. He had that little tractor and a little uh, three-point hitch rototiller. So he wanted to be able to back in there and till the ground up. And you might even have some people that want to run a small um, plastic mulch layer through there. So there's a big wide open door that could be opened and closed, kind of like, even like the middle picture where you've got that garage door, uh, that can, uh, canister type door. And then you see the picture on the bottom right, which is a, a zippered door. So it could open up all the way also. And then the picture there in the right middle is a, uh, a grower. She, she was growing cut flowers over in, uh, in southeastern Virginia. And she didn't need to do much tillage work. She had a, a, a small rototiller and it worked, it went perfectly through that, that small opening. And uh, she had uh, woven ground cover in between the rows of, of her flowers. So it, it, she didn't really need to, a big, huge door there. So it can vary, uh, you know, depending on what you need to move in and out of there, people or equipment, uh, but it can all just be however you need to make it, make it work for you. And usually that's covered with, uh, a plastic, a polyethylene sheet, or sometimes like that picture in the bottom, uh, the bottom middle, it's more of a hard plastic uh, polycarbonate material that uh, that's on the end walls. So I mentioned the side curtain before for these high tunnels, and so for ventilation uh, and movement of air through the structure, you, you really need that. And so this, uh, this is what it might look like. It might be a roll up curtain like you see on the sides there. Uh, I'm sorry, on the top right, where it, it rolls up and it ventilates. Or it could look like the one in the bottom middle that it drops down to ventilate. So it, it's made a little differently. If you've ever seen poultry houses, uh, usually they have a curtain that's very similar to this, the bottom picture. So it's a drop down curtain. And that's really preferable if, you, if you're thinking about ventilation. That bottom, the, the drop down curtain is what we call it, is. Um, doesn't leak as much on the corners as a roll-up curtain. Uh, it's a little more expensive in terms of materials to put on, but it's uh, probably the best choice for most people. Um, <clears throat> then you also might have some ridge vents, even the whole ridge vent, like that top picture where the vent completely opens up, or the one um, at the, in the right middle picture where it's a kind of like a kind of like a uh, moon roof in a car. It just it, it it's somewhere in the plastic, it opens up and um, it's not the whole length of, the, of it. And then you see the ridge, outside ridge vents on the other two pictures. And so as that heat rises, um, maybe even for winter cooling, you can open that up and let that heat out um, early in the morning, but you also wanna think about trapping heat in when it's cool to, to keep it warm in there at night. So there's, we'll talk a little bit about that in the management section. So generally, you know, high tunnel costs can vary. And, and I've got quite a range here, anywhere from four to six dollars a square foot. You know, if you if you measured the the, the perimeter, the footprint, uh, the area, I guess, of the of the structure, probably four to five dollars a square foot for the materials. And for somebody to put it up, probably two to three dollars a square foot. And this again, this just really varies according to uh, uh, the manufacturer, what you're doing. Um, even this publication down here at the bottom from Arkansas, check that out. It talks about the costs of putting together a structure, uh, just using things like, uh, kind of like uh, EMT conduit, but it's really what you might call um, tubing that, that goes with chain link fence, uh, something that, that you might be able to find and bend yourself. So there's different ways you can do this, of course. 
Um, it just kind of depends on, on, uh, on what your resources are and, and what you're going to do with it. Um, when we think about managing a structure, so we built it, we've got crops growing in it. Um, at some time during the year, you're growing crops in it. Uh, there are a lot of things that you need to manage. And, and a lot of times I'll, I'll mention that high tunnels are, especially when compared to conventional vegetable production outside or even gardening, they're much more management intensive and in a lot of ways, much more labor intensive also. So that's something to think about. And there are some things you've got to manage, the temperature, the, the light, the irrigation, all these things. Uh, play an important role in, uh, in, in being successful. Um, temperature is probably going to be one of the most important things that we, uh, that we think of uh, when, we're, when we're looking at a high tunnel structure. And we, want, we think about uh, a high tunnel structure being too, getting too hot or getting too cold. A lot of times we think of it that way, but also it can get very hot. So, so we're here in where I am, you know, Petersburg area, Richmond area, we are, um, we're past the time, we would put tomatoes, for example, in the tunnel generally around the third week in March. Uh, and our last frost date is probably uh, in this area, probably the third week in April. So what we're looking for is about a month of uh, early, uh, earliness there. So we, we, put a, we put tomato transplants in about a month earlier, for example. And so hopefully for the grower, that'll translate into about a month of earliness um, versus outside production uh, in June. Um, but, you know, where you all are a little bit higher elevation, a little bit cooler, you know, it's a little bit different, a little bit, you just shift a little bit. Um, but as we get into May here, certainly, you know, it becomes more important uh, to think about ventilation, think about cooling the structure down. So in the, in the, in March and April and some into May, we're thinking about, you know, trapping as much heat as we can inside the structure so at night it stays warm enough in there uh, to keep the, keep the plants growing as, as optimum as you can. So this little um, chart adapted from uh, Lewis Jett just kind of shows some thresholds for ventilation and some of the temperatures you want to see for, for some of these crops, um, both warm season and then when you think about maybe leafy greens and some of the brassicas, it's a little different. But again, um, you know, temperature is very important. Even maybe utilizing something like a shade cloth to reduce heat load as you get into June and July, depending on what you've got in there. And then also things like closing the curtains early in the in the cooler cooler time um, to uh, to make sure that you try kind of trap uh, trap some of that heat in there. And things like I think I had a picture of the barrels, black barrels, like you see here on the bottom picture, um, and wa black water tubes, um, all those things. These black barrels would be filled with water also. Those, what we're thinking about is a, um, a situation where you're creating a, a heat sink. It's warming up during the day and radiating some of that heat at night. Um, so as we move through this a little bit, I don't wanna go over too over on time. Um, let's see. I'll mention snow because this can be a real issue. And I talked about wind and snow loads, uh, but this is still a structure that is, is, uh, can very easily collapse if you're not careful. Uh, wet, heavy snow that sits on it and is not shedded off the structure can, can collapse it. And so when I talk about management and labor intensity, you know, this is one of those things, if it's, if it's snowing and you're getting three or four inches of snow and it's midnight and it's wet snow, um, you know, you're probably going to be out there somehow with a push broom pushing from the inside of the structure or maybe with a rope trying to knock some of the, um, the snow off the outside to try to get that off because you don't want to lose your structure. When we, talk, we talked about how expensive it is, um, it, it, you know, you don't want to lose it. So this kind of thing can happen, uh, but you just have to kind of... Um, be aware that it's an issue and, you, and, you, and, and that can happen. Um, I mentioned earlier when you're planning the site, it's nice to have wind breaks because wind is an issue too, but at the same time, you don't want a lot of shade trees around. You, uh, for most of the things we're thinking about growing, uh, you know, these veg a lot of the vegetable crops we're talking about growing need um, six to eight hours of sunlight every day. And so, 
Um, you know, it's important when you're when you're thinking about where to site it. Are you going to have sun at a certain time of the year? And there's some apps out there now that can kind of show you uh, where your plot is and what it's going to look like in March, what it's going to look like in June in terms of sun and shading. And so it's something to think about. I mentioned two layers of plastic and you, you get a little bit more shading with every layer of plastic. So that's that's something to consider also. All right. So irrigation, this is a covered a covered situation. And so uh, you can't rely on rainwater. So for, for growers and even home gardeners, you know, I suggest they, they think about some type of irrigation, whether it's a uh, drip tape or a soaker hose or something like that, where they can, uh, they can irrigate the crops and make sure that, the, that they're growing in, in optimum conditions. And the same with, with fertilization, uh, being able to use that drip line and some type of fertilizer injection system to, uh, to get the, the water soluble fertilizer to the plant is a nice way to do it. Or maybe along with some incorporated uh, fertilization um, and, and you know, consulting, you know, uh, things like the uh, commercial vegetable guide, the Southeast Conver commercial vegetable guide, things like that that can help you uh, figure out what, uh, where you should be with, and, and then soil tests, of course. Uh, I will just mention briefly pests in the structure, in greenhouses and high tunnels, you're going to see some things, uh, you're going to exclude some pests naturally, but you're also going to see some things like spider mites and and sometimes uh, you'll see um, more aphids and, and white flies in there because it's a lush growing environment and uh, and the plants are going to be in there early and and they're going to find you so but it also there's a possibility that you can use beneficial insects predators and parasitoids to to help take out some of the um, some of those insects or keep some of those insect pop those pest populations in check so I'm going to I'm moving through kind of quick now, but there's a few things I wanted to uh, continue to touch on. Um, <clears throat> the possibility when we think about fertilizer, we think about uh, adding fertilizer to year after year to maybe tomatoes or peppers or something like that. Uh, you can get high soluble salts, salt levels in the soil in the structure because remember it's covered, of course, and it, there's no rainwater to kind of leach some of that out of the soil that would naturally occur otherwise, and so. Um, you can see this, especially with young transplants, young plants, uh, they are very susceptible. So if you put the, your transplants in there uh, after a couple of years of, of really hard production, you'll see that uh, you'll see some issues with those and it, it might be because of high soluble salt levels there. Um, and so a few things can happen. You can try to take, you can take the cover off uh, Occasionally, I, I know, but it's expensive real estate, so you don't want to do that, but that you can let it leach through there and maybe in an off season. Uh, you can leach through maybe with some type of overhead irrigation or drip tape. Um, and then there's also movable uh, high tunnels um, that, are, that are pretty interesting. And, and Kentucky actually has uh, done some work uh, with, with different move, movable high tunnels. And I've known people also that have, that have made their own with tracks or some type of pipe and uh, a rail and wheel system where they can move the structure after a couple of years. It, it moves in a straight line, but it can, um, you can allow that ground to rest and, and, and leach out salts and you can work on that other ground that's covered for a, for a little while. So we're going to move on through. I think I'll, I'll go past some of this stuff. Um, marketing is important as in any vegetable enterprise or any horticulture crop enterprise, marketing is very important. Uh, and it's the same with, uh, with growing things in a high tunnel. So, uh, so some different outlets here. Um, certainly direct marketing works well with a, with a high tunnel. Um, so it's a roadside stand, a farmer's market, something like that. Um, as we look at crops, one of the first crops we think of in a structure is gonna be tomatoes. That's one that's fairly easy to grow. It's easy to sell. And we see, we see high tunnel growers really reaping some benefits in terms of yield and quality with, with tomatoes out of a high tunnel. You can see some tomatoes, that's a variety called beet orange at the bottom picture there. And you can see that it's been, uh, it's been suckered a little bit, uh, some suckering going on there. 
uh, to kind of make a, a less bushy plant. And that's one way that you would, that's, a, that's an indeterminate variety that you would, uh, you can see the tall stakes there. It's a Florida string weave situation with tall stakes. That's, that's always a good one. We've been doing some work with um, things like cut flowers also, you know, from, for some people, they don't think about ornamental, ornamentals, but, you know, cut flowers can be a really nice um, addition maybe to your, to your uh, production. Um, or they could be something you start out on. Those are snapdragons. And there's lots of, there's some cool season cut flowers that can do really well in a high tunnel uh, in Virginia. It allows you to start a little bit earlier and you all know that sometimes it just goes from spring to summer just like that. And so uh, having, a, having a high tunnel, be able to put some of these cool season crops in a little earlier gives them a little bit longer uh, production window. And then we've worked with some growers on things like uh, some, some other alternative ones like raspberries in the top uh, right picture and then ginger in the top, uh, I'm sorry, in the bottom uh, left picture, which, uh, which are kind of more specialized uh, niche type crops, but, um, but might, have, uh, might have some potential for, for some growers. And there's some cool season uh, crops I think can do, can do pretty well in a high tunnel, um, especially into the fall and maybe early in the spring. And in some cases, um, uh, like uh, on Naturel Farm, you know, all the way through the winter time. And so uh, that can be a, a, a valuable uh, crop for you as leafy greens, brassicas, uh, lettuce, things like that, some herbs, they can do, uh, they can do really well for you. Sorry, I've got a, an attack dog here that's, uh, that's barking in the background, I apologize. Um, so as I kind of wrap up, because I don't want to keep you too long, and I want to have a little bit of time for questions and discussion. Um, this is a more, a fairly intensive way of producing crops. Um, the right site is very important. We talked a little bit about that. I talked a lot about construction because I just wanted you to see that it's not that difficult to put uh, to put one of these structures up. So I probably spent more time than probably bored you a little bit too much on the construction part. But um, if you if you're getting a lot of snow, like you might in Southwest Virginia or eastern Eastern Kentucky, you you might think about uh, a peaked structure instead of a rounded roof because that peaked roof they sometimes call it Gothic or peaked style is going to shed snow a little bit better. Uh, in general, higher sidewalls are always better for ventilation. If you can imagine a tall crop like uh, raspberries or tomatoes or um, cucumbers trellised up, you know, uh, it's harder for, for air movement through those tall crops. So higher, higher sidewall for ventilation is usually good. Um, but anyway, some of, the, some of these things are kind of common sense. Um, Okay, I think here's some resources I'll mention here. Um, and some here's just a few vendors that, that are associated with high tunnels like Puckett and Farm Tech and Atlas and Berry Hill Irrigation and Johnny Seeds and Rimall Greenhouses. And there's lots and lots of them out there. I just listed a few here. And then there's also some links here that are pretty interesting um, that, that, that you might check out um, as well, you know, the Noble Foundation, um, SARE group, the ATRA group, and there's, there's lots of good high tunnel information out there. And I will actually uh, say this book is pretty good too. This is the year round hoop house. It's pretty comprehensive, uh, covers everything. Uh, Pam Dowling uh, wrote this a couple years ago and it's got a lot of pictures, a lot of inf good information from, from her experience uh, working with uh, high tunnels over a number of years, growing lots of different crops. So if you're really interested, I think that one, that's a good book resource right there. Well, that's, uh, that was quick and dirty about high tunnels, but I want, like I said, I wanted to keep some time here for questions and discussion and, and us to have a conversation a little bit about, about high tunnels. So Phil, I, I already see there's something in the chat. Uh, yes, I think Woody had shared some resources he was aware of, uh, a video series from Grow Appalachia on high uh, tunnel construction, Good. then some resources from the uh, Center for Crop Diversification at the University of Kentucky, one yeah. for planning dates and, uh, and one for uh, just some resources in regards to high tunnels, it looks like. 
That's great. Yeah, those are great resources and hopefully will help Let's help somebody out there. But I'm willing to talk, ask, answer questions. I'll try to answer questions or whatever you want to do now. Okay, folks, you can unmute yourself if you have a question or just type it into the, the chat box. And, and Chris, I just uh, a little bit of a question. I know several years ago, I think it was Penn State that was doing some work with raspberries and high tunnels. And you mentioned that you had helped some folks in Virginia. Are you seeing pretty good uh, interest in that in Virginia? Is that something that we're going to see more of? Or uh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think it, you know, when you think about the the brambles in Virginia, black blackberries are kind of more popular. People are familiar are more familiar with blackberries as opposed to raspberries, but raspberries can do very well. We're doing some work with blackberries and raspberries in tunnels, but uh -huh. um, the raspberries can can do very well uh, in the tunnels. And it it again, a lot of it goes back to the marketing situation you have, and can you sell raspberries where you are? And can you get a high enough market value to make it to make it work? Um, so we've got a few. We probably, when we think of those, some of those specialty crops, those niche crops we were talking about. I think we've had, I think some farmers had better luck with ginger and turmeric in the high tunnels, mm -hmm. um, and and there's been some success with with raspberries. But um, I think we're seeing more and more people adopt or try ginger and turmeric because consumers are starting to be very interested or have been very interested in, in, in health conscious and looking at maybe some crops that not only have nutritional benefit, but maybe some health benefits also. And uh, there's definitely some documented health benefits for both ginger and turmeric. So, so we see some consumers that are, that are wanting more locally grown things like that. And so, it, it, you know, with a, with a more of a tropical crop like that, it gives you, um, maybe some options. Yeah. And we're talking about when we think about ginger, we're talking about not full season ginger. It's, it's usually an immature stage. So it's not quite, we call it baby ginger and it's, it's uh, not fully matured, but it, it, it's, it's really good and it works well. It goes, um, if you're selling to food service chefs and things like that, they love it. And, and people are wow. starting to like it. Yeah. See, uh, looks like Shad had a question in the chat. Uh, list of crops that are economically viable at that management level. Yeah, um, you know, I, I I mentioned I mentioned some of the spring summer crops, but I think tomatoes certainly is one that's that you're going to make money on uh, just about anywhere that you're at uh, because they're so easy to grow and they're fairly easy to sell. I think you're going to see the same thing with peppers. Um, and then even if you think, and when you think about um, one of the videos I was going to show tonight, we ran out of time was uh, a farmer in Louisa County, Virginia. And she, she, mo she focuses a lot on cool season vegetables, um, cabbage, uh, um, radishes, lettuce, different all different types of lettuce in her high tunnel. And she's growing them in raised beds, but in her high tunnel throughout the, uh, throughout the fall, through, through the winter time. And um, she's, fortunately she can sell into the Charlottesville area and she's got, she sells to a CSA, uh, through a CSA system. And so it works for her because of her location situation. But um, I certainly have known others too that are very successful with the cool season crops. And so um, I'll try to find a link, Phil, where we did a presentation not too long ago we, about cool season crops and kind of got that video with her. It might be interesting for some some people to to check out. Sounds sounds cool. Uh, I I heard a presenter several years ago. They were from the Bowling Green, Kentucky area, and I think they were doing microgreens maybe. And I I think it was in a hot tunnel. Might have been just a, a low tunnel, but. Uh, they had published uh, self-published a book. I think I remember it was called Walk into Spring, but yeah. how they had uh, is the microgreen thing. Is that something that still? Yeah, that was probably the Weedekers and All Natural Farm, and they they did a lot of cool season crops, but they probably did microgreens also. And um, that one can be a, a great crop 
you, know, you can imagine that you could flood the market pretty quickly if, if a lot of growers started doing microgreens um, because you're generally selling those to, uh, to food service to, uh, well, not all the time, but you're selling it to, um, you know, restaurants. And I've known, I've known a few growers also that are selling to, um, to CSAs or subscription type situations where they add microgreens in. Uh, and I've seen, I've known growers that have sold them at farmer's markets too, definitely, um, and had pretty good success um, because, but that's a little bit about uh, at the farmer's market level and at the CSA level, you're, you're thinking about educating the consumer. A lot of people might not have ever considered microgreens on an entree or in a salad or whatever you're going to use it for, um, you know, baby, you know, baby beets and baby onions and things like that. Uh, but uh, once consumers start to see that the flavor is very good, I mean, when you take a microgreen uh, of, um, you know, uh, a cucumber microgreen and you eat it, it tastes just like a cucumber. So it's, it's uh, once they, they see them, they'll like them. Um, I've got a video about microgreens. I could probably try to try to link to you also that people might be on the call might be interested in, but I think microgreens have some potential. Um, it just depends on, on where you're at, where your market is. Yeah, well, overall, I guess I'll just say overall, I think the, the high tunnels can be a, you, know, you need to think of them like a tool um, in your farming operation and that they're there <clears throat> just like you'd use um, a tractor in a way, you know, or a tiller or something. They're there. They're, they're a tool that you're going to use to, uh, to extend the growing season. So it's, it's, uh, it can be good. I would still encourage people to think about uh, talking to their NRCS local representative and see if they can uh, get involved in any quick program too. Good deal. Uh, I, I reach out for those of you in, in Wise County, uh, Wes Stanley would be the, uh, the NRCS representative, the district conservationist you would speak with about the, uh, the high tunnel program. And I, I think he told me that uh, October, they're going to start taking applications again. So, uh, so you got a little bit of time. But uh, just just mark your calendar for October and, and be sure to get those applications in because I I would love to see more more people taking advantage of that in this this uh, part of the state. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I don't know how competitive it is around around your area. Um, some areas are more competitive on the application process than others, but they could let you know. But any, any final questions for, for Chris? Chris, I have a question about when, the, when does a high tunnel become a greenhouse? What's the, what's the real distinguishing difference? Yeah, well, it, it's kind of all semantics, but I guess when you put a heater, when you put what we call active heating and cooling systems in a structure, so when it's got a, a fan, that, an exhaust fan and an event, and it's probably got some type of maybe propane or some type of, maybe usually propane fired heater in there. Um, we think of it as a greenhouse. Um, so it, it kind of, it varies and the costs are gonna be, you know, a little different. So when you think about adding, you know, I, I mentioned maybe four or $5 a square foot. So when you think about a greenhouse and you add some of these systems and controls, whether they're a thermostatic control or it's some sort of um, uh, incremental control system, it can add another four, three to four, five dollars per square foot. It, it just it kind of depends on what you what you want to get. So that's a great question. I think we look at they're kind of on a line on a continuum where you've got a high tunnel structure, and a lot of growers will think about eventually because these are metal frames, just like normal greenhouses. They'll think about eventually they'll get to the point where they might add a heater for more control, more earliness. Them, they maybe add, will add fans for ventilation. So it can all be added later on. Chris, I heard of something one time. So I want to see if uh, you agree with this or you've ever heard of it. I heard of someone that 
that put plastic over their structure. It was during the summer, I guess, when things were quite warm, they stretched it really tight. And then that winter, it, when it got cold and contracted, it uh, collapsed the structure. Is that possible? Well, it, I don't know it's possible it could collapse it. It, it, could, it could rip the plastic potentially, because you know, think about what happens. It's, it's 90 degrees, you're putting the plastic on and uh, when it gets, uh, well, you know, it, it, it's pretty loose at that point. Let's just say you put it on a little bit cooler than that. And then in the wintertime, it contracts and gets tighter and tighter and tighter, uh, depending on how cold it gets in your area. It could, it, could, uh, it could damage the plastic. Now, I don't know about the structure itself. Most of the damage we see to structures are going to be from snow that's going to you know, push down on it and potentially collapse it. And then there's wind and we'll see wind will do things like push it to one side. But I've also known of structures that have been lifted up with a, an uplift wind and actually pick the structure up and turn it over on its top. And so um, that can happen. I've seen that happen in a few places actually in, in Sandy, Sandy Land, Virginia Beach area. Um, yeah, I've known of that happening. And even, um, there's one in Floyd that did that, that I, I knew the people and worked with them and they, it picked it up and turned it over. So um, I mentioned those ground stakes being put in the ground and just being pounded in. But if you've got really sandy land, every now and then you might want to even put some concrete into that, maybe auger a hole out, dig a hole out, put your ground stake and put some concrete around it, maybe on the corners and one in, in the middle of each side, because uh, that can happen.